UMV stands for Ultra Mobility Vehicle, and our goals are to combine the best of both worlds from the efficiency of wheeled robotics and the athleticism of legged robots. The Institute is really interested in building technology and capability. If you want to think about just a jumping bicycle, that's the best way to understand how UMV works. It works in much the same way a human would jumping on a bicycle, where a human would use their mass of their upper body and their legs to get their center of mass moving upwards and then bring the bike with them, allow them to jump up a curb or jump up on a, a rock or something. And of course, the balance aspect of it, you know, everybody kind of has who's ridden bicycle has an intuitive feel of how the bicycle balances. You know, you're gonna use the steering wheel. Uh, we do that as well. On the hardware side, there's a lot of challenges. In trying to reach our goal, we need to be able to design a robot that is robust enough uh, to survive all the crashes during testing, but also lightweight to be able to jump and flip and do all those tricks that we're capable of doing. And to do that, we're often working at the edge of what our hardware and what our electronics are able to do. When we first started, we started from scratch. We had two tracks working in parallel, a model-based approach and a reinforcement learning approach. We just found that reinforcement learning was faster to, to run on the robot and to deploy in the robot. We were able to achieve better and more robust behaviors with reinforcement learning. We're training all the policies in, in simulation. So we are taking a couple of sequence of actions and then we're ending up in a certain state that we either like or we don't like. And then we then try to um, avoid this situation altogether or make it reappear in the future. We do include a lot of model based in our reinforcement learning pipeline. Part of what we do with the Synterweal, for example, is that in hardware, we try to basically uh, perform multiple experiments so that we can get um, different kinds of properties for the wheel, different kinds of properties for the motors. We have a number of sensors on the robot and the software team is taking the data from all of those sensors uh, and running it in simulation to be able to figure out uh, where we are in the world so that we can autonomously navigate and be very athletic uh, in, the, in the tricks we perform. We also have challenging load cases of the robot could flip and crash in new ways. Um, you know, it could hit obstacles, it could land on its head, it could land on its back. And so as we're developing this hardware, it needs to be a really iterative process. The benefits of using simulated data, data during the, the learning process is that we do not need to uh, deploy these robots in the real world while they are learning. In RL tends to learn a lot from complete disaster and sometimes um, they would probably break uh, the robot uh, if, if this learning process would happen in the real world. One of the problems in, in reinforcement learning or in, in the way of how we currently uh, utilize reinforcement learning is that um, these robots they train in simulation and the simulation is not perfect. There is always a gap between simulation and reality. But also in simulation, we noticed that one of the sensory gaps, you would run it in simulation, go around on the robot, the robot would just fall out and we would be maxing out our currents, we'd be maxing out our, our power essentially. And one way to overcome this or one solution that we found out is to actually include our um, battery models and include our uh, power models, essentially put it back into simulation. So we are modeling our batteries, we're modeling our electronics inside simulation. That way the policy gets to see that um, the, the, the currents or the power that it, that it can exert and we try to limit that and then we try to replicate it on the robot and try to respect the actual battery um, limits that we have on, on the robot, on the real robot. Even though we're a research lab, we want the robots to really work. For an example, you know, a goal we might set is it needs to be able to do this thing 15 times in a row without a failure, right, 15 times. That means you have a very, you know, well, well less than a 10% chance of failure. We've never seen a robot in the world do anything like this. You know, the bicycle form means the robot has to basically continually balance, dynamically balance. But then, how do I put sensing on the robot in co compute so that it can look at the, its world quickly and adapt its motion to what it sees coming? Can I sense how I'm moving in the world precisely? precisely enough so that it could jump up on a table or on a, on a, on a handrail, like you see guys on bikes do. Um, how, do I, how do I get that perception pipeline operating at what we call at the Institute human cadence, as fast as a human would, right? And at human levels of performance, or superhuman levels of performance. All that sort of fast perception, those are, that I think is really gonna you know, move the needle, so to speak, in robotics.